Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this special phone-in hosted by the Moody Davitt Report. I'm Martin Moody. I'm the founder and chairman, and I'm talking to you from London, England. And together with my business partner, Dermot Davitt, in Galway, Ireland, we're pleased to welcome you to this important call. It's designed to bring the travel, retail, aviation, and tourism sectors the latest facts and insight on the COVID-19 situation, the crisis, and an expert view on what lies ahead goes without saying that everyone on this call fully understands the gravity of the situation globally in personal, health, general economic, and of course, specific business sector terms. We have many readers, listeners from all around the globe on this call, and it's my honor once more to be joined today by our special guest, Dr. David Heyman, Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and head of the center on Global Health Security at Chatham House, London. From 2012 to March 2017, Dr. Heyman was Chairman of Public Health England, and earlier in a remarkable career, he was Executive Director of the Communicable Diseases Cluster and headed the global response to SARS in 2003. Importantly, he also chairs an expert panel advising the World Health Organization on emergencies and will in fact be able to share some aspects of the discussions that are play, taking place with that body right now. Dr. Heyman, thank you for being with us. Thanks very much, Martin, and uh, thanks to all of you for, for having tuned in. Maybe I'll just start by going geographically, starting with China. Uh, all of you know that China has had quite a bit of success in decreasing the transmission of this virus in the epicenter and also has stopped many outbreaks outside the epicenter. And they continue to um, try to interrupt transmission completely of this virus. And they're beginning to lift some of their lockdown procedures and getting some people back to work very cautiously while the rest of the world watches to see what happens. Of course, the concern is that there might be a second wave coming out of China. And especially as their air traffic increases as well, it may be that this spreads uh, further internationally, but at present, China is having more cases that come in every day from Europe and um, other parts of the world than are actually occurring um, in China based on what they understand about their epidemic. And they've been very free in sharing their information with, with the World Health Organization since they first reported the outbreak. In uh, the rest of Asia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in um, um, South Korea, for example, they've had quite a good success quite good success in decreasing the transmission of the virus. And uh, in places like Singapore, where I was about two weeks ago uh, to do some teaching, they actually have continued much business as usual and continued with schools open. And they're watching very closely to see what's happening. So far, they have not been able to trace any um, new cases back to someone who was in school. So they feel that their school opening pro possibly hasn't caused any major impact on the outbreak yet, but they're watching very cautiously. And they've recently, um, as you know, um, stopped travel coming into Singapore from other places. In Singapore, uh, business continues more or less as usual with temperature taking between um, of everyone as they enter a public space, such as a restaurant or a government building. And in the lectures at the university, lectures of over 50 people are being held um, virtually, but under 50 are being held in the classroom and a picture is taken before um, the class begins so that if someone should get sick who's in that audience, they'll know who, know who was sitting around them to contact as necessary. But Singapore um, has been the most liberal uh, in how they've approached this and they learned a lot from the SARS outbreak, but still they're being very cautious now and even more cautious because that reproductive number, which has been below the, the limit of, of one, which it means one person infected from each person who has infection, um, they are seeing it gradually increase toward that level of one. So right now it's below one as it is in Hong Kong and in um, South Korea, but they're seeing it gradually increase. South, South Korea has done a remarkable job in containing the major outbreaks that occurred mainly from two church gatherings and they've been able to decrease the numbers of new cases, and they've also been able to prevent um, high levels of mortality, as has Singapore, um, partly because they were prepared. They've each had coronavirus outbreaks in the past, 
um, uh, South Korea had a MERS coronavirus outbreak, a major outbreak, and um, um, Singapore, a SARS outbreak. So they're gradually caging this virus in, but as, as I said, they are seeing it increase gradually in transmissibility and it's in the community. So they're anticipating that it will continue to circulate. And the same is more or less true for China, uh, for uh, Hong Kong rather. Uh, they see cases come in from China across the border and they're immediately identified and isolated. And testing is very important because you can isolate people as soon as you find they're um, infected and therefore you decrease new chains of transmission from them. So Asia has done a remarkable job in the initial st steps to contain the virus. It's now seeing it gradually increase in transmissibility. Um, there, there appears to be a second wave um, coming along. In the Middle East, um, the major source of infection has been a pilgrimage site in Iran, and that has then spread out into many countries in the Middle East. And those countries are taking um, very uh, draconian measures, and they have two different populations they're working with, as you know from the Middle East. One is the local national populations, and one are these guest workers who are in um, quite cramped conditions many times in, in dormitories, and they're trying to make sure that there isn't an introduction of virus into those places as well. So that's their strategy in the Middle East, and the jury is still out as to what's happening in the Middle East, it's not clear what's going on in um, Iran at this point. Then looking into Europe, you've seen what happens in a country where there is no preparedness or is there, there's weak preparedness and not enough hospital beds and ventilators as has occurred in Italy and now in Spain, where there are extremely high levels of mortality. Um, these high levels of mortality are due to an aging population in these countries as well as um, a lack of hospital beds and ventilators for patients who are sick. And they've seen very, very high levels of mortality among those who are elderly and have comorbidities. In the rest of, um, of Europe, um, they're seeing also an increase in cases after initial efforts to contain those outbreaks. And various strategies are being developed in different countries based on the national risk assessment and the capacities in those countries to do such things as testing, isolation, and um, uh, putting of patients on ventilators. And most of the strategies in Europe are now to flatten the curve to make sure that their hospital system isn't overwhelmed. And there are new um, ventures which are under, being undertaken, such as in the UK, where the National Health Service has worked with the private sector to increase the number of public beds available and the number of ventilators available. North America has varied, um, <clears throat> varied uh, responses depending on the states in the US. There are several states, New York, California, and others that have taken measures very similar to what's been going on in many parts of Europe with, um, with a decrease with keeping people indoors, recommending that they keep indoors. Um, and it's still early in the US and, and to see what's going to happen in that. Whereas Canada, just north of the border, has chosen a different strategy. Remember, they had SARS outbreaks, and they're dealing with this in, in quite a different way. Um, they haven't yet shut down everything, but they're trying to instill in their people what needs to be instilled in people everywhere, that they have the capacity to control this outbreak themselves if they understand, number one, that they can prevent infection of others if they're sick by staying away from others, self-isolating, and if they have to be with others to wear a mask that prevents their cough and their sneeze from contaminating others or surfaces in the area where others could touch and become infected by then touching their faces. In um, the other strategy, of course, is protect yourself, and that's by social or physical distancing, social distancing being, distancing being shutting, shutting down cinemas and other mass events, and um, at the same time, um, self-isolating, making sure that you guard at least two meter distance, one and a half to two meters between people outside, whereas in families you can be together as long as there aren't the elderly, and the elderly have to be treated in a very special way, as do nursing homes. And nursing homes are a target for um, um, prevention activities in all countries. Um, they're doing it differently depending on the country and the culture. So I think in general, what people are anticipating is that these measures will at least flatten the curve, but the disease will not be gone. It will not disappear. Um, some people had hoped that it will disappear in the summer months. 
This is certainly possible because other respiratory infections do decrease in summer months. Uh, the flu season has a finite ending at this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere as springtime comes and as people are more out of doors and less in confined spaces. And at the same time, mucous membranes, which are where this virus lives, are drier in winter months, which permits in some instances easier infection than in the summer months when the mucous membranes are more moist. Those are, those are characteristics that will impact on transmissibility perhaps. It's not clear that they will, but they certainly impact on the common cold and on influenza, which is at this point in time decreasing. Some studies are going on to look at the virus um, to understand if the virus itself has some characteristic which will not permit it to spread in the warm, humid summer months, but as we all know, it's been very healthily transmitting in parts of Asia, such as Singapore, and now in Hong Kong, where springtime is occurring. So it's not clear that the virus has any particular characteristics which would make it less um, transmissible in the summer months. Uh, so that's a brief um, overview. Um, the, the virus can live on surfaces, um, in droplets, and in some studies it's been shown that it can live up to 72 hours on plastic surfaces. So surfaces where people who are infected or people who are thought to be infected are, are very important to keep washed down and clean of virus so that people don't inadvertently touch those surfaces and then their faces. I want to ask you about the second wave because, as you say, the Chinese containment measures and the uh, South Korean containment measures had been uh, remarkably effective and, and um, some other neighboring countries or zones, Hong Kong, China and, and Singapore, as mentioned. Now, um, as you know, there is an increasing concern in Hong Kong, for example, about re-imports even today um, on the Chinese mainland, I believe of um, 78 uh, new cases, uh, only one actually in Hubei province, um, but of the remaining 77, 74 were imported from overseas and a similar trend uh, we've, we've seen in Hong Kong. Undoubtedly, this is leading to uh, further travel constraints. So how concerned are you uh, about that second wave? And leading on from that, uh, I, I want to ask you about the role, perhaps the future of the travel industry. Everyone on this call is directly related in fact to that sector. Well, I think WHO has changed its view to letting countries do their own risk assessment and make their own um, recommendations based on that risk assessment. You know, the world has changed since the, the regulations that govern international travel and trade and outbreaks were developed back in 1969 and then modified in 2005. And now there's an incredible amount of information that's available both informally through um, discussion groups on the internet of clinicians, of epidemiologists, of virologists, and also um, discussion, uh, and also from um, published information in medical journals, which is rapidly peer reviewed, put out in medical journals in front of the paywall, and permitting countries to have access to all kinds of information that they didn't at one time have access to. So they're doing their own risk assessment and making their own recommendations. And I think WHO understands that and will be trying to figure out how to move ahead. Um, there have been several meetings. In fact, uh, every other day, there's a meeting with the advisory group that I chair trying to look at, at such issues as well as issues as to how a country can best begin to unlock its um, severe precautionary measures of travel and, and, uh, and industrial production and, and social gatherings. And these will be discussed again today in a meeting at, um, at, uh, in, in Geneva, a virtual meeting, where we will have experts from the countries where they're having good success in outbreak containment, countries where they're not having good success, and then the advisory group of 12 independent experts from around the world who will be working with the WHO Secretariat to look at see what some of the measures might be that countries should begin to think about as they unlock. And those will be, of course, based on national risk assessment of what they can do and what they think can do. I'm not sure where travel will fit into that, but certainly the travel industry has been um, um, severely affected. And I think there are ways that 
the travel industry can begin to think about how they can make their industry more safe. Some of them are radical measures, and I'm not saying they're useful, but they, they may at least provide the public with, um, with more um, certainty. And those issues might be um, if there's a cruise coming up that everybody must have a, a test to see whether they've had um, an infection in the past or at present. In antibody studies, those studies that can tell whether or not somebody in the past has had infection are just now becoming on the market, but many of them have not been validated. And what that means is that we know that they work against some people who have antibody who have recovered, but they also may interact with other antibody from other coronaviruses. And so they need to be validated to see if they really are specific to this coronavirus or not. If they are, then it would be easy to see people who have had infection in the past, during the past three months, and they could be um, somehow um, in a different category than those people who are still susceptible. So there are all kinds of things coming on the market that may help in the innovation of the travel industry as they think about how they want to proceed, understanding that, um, that there really is no um, guarantee that any of these measures will um, prevent infection being carried on public conveyances. If I pointed you at Europe, for example, perhaps we should start with Italy, which has been such a tragic situation. Um, you'll be looking closely to see where the inflection point is there. What can the general public um, predict looking ahead, do you think, based on best knowledge today? <laughs> well, I think one of the measures that the general public can use to see whether or not there can be an impact is to see how their neighbors and their fellow citizens are behaving. If people are not paying attention to the warnings not to uh, walk in the public, you know, with others who are not from the same household, if they're congregating with them and they're not keeping a physical distance, and if they're, the country is not closing down public places, um, uh, then there will be not a lack of assurance that the government or that the recommendations are being taken to heart by people. And I will say again that people must be at the heart of this, understanding how to prevent themselves from being infected and also preventing others from getting infected from them should they be sick. And if the public begins to see that everybody understands this and is changing the way they live, not in, in France, for example, giving a kiss on each cheek when they meet each other at this point in time, then they can be assured that at least the public is doing its job to try to decrease uh, transmission by distancing from one another. But to be able to say for sure what's happening can only come from the figures. And, and you know, Italy is now at a point where figures are one day on the increase and then on the decrease, but the general trend in Italy appears to be that they have flattened the curve now and they're pulling out of a very terrible experience that they've had, mainly because they just didn't have the hospital beds and they have this population that's at the, this elderly population at the, time, at the top of their population pyramid, about 22% over the age of 65 so, or 60. So it's, very, it's a very difficult issue for many countries. And as you said, each country has to make its own judgment. But as a general population, you can begin to see if people who are going to the beaches, such as was in Bondi Beach, have stopped going now, if they continue to guard a distance between themselves and, and continue to do what is recommended, uh, then things can take a rapid change. Do you, when you meet with your fellow health experts and within the WHO, how much uh, of the dialogue is around the other toll of this crisis, which is the economic toll, the business toll. And uh, as you know, that's, that's mounting um, and it's pretty catastrophic in, in many, many countries around the world. Um, do, do, do you talk about both aspects and, can the, and, and how best can the health and the business community work, uh, work together? Yeah, Martin, and that's a, that's a good question. You know, there is a lot of, of, there are a lot of models that are showing the cost benefit of economic cost benefit of intervening and identifying patients and isolating them as opposed to letting an outbreak continue and having a severe mortality um, in the elderly populations in hospitals. 
But in general, countries don't put a price on saving a life. And so saving lives is the bottom line in all countries. And at present, they're willing to spend what money they must in order to save those lives, which is the way we've been oriented in our societies, and which is the oath, actually, that all the medical profession takes to save a life. So, you know, there are cost-benefit analyses, but these really aren't valid in making decisions. But I think the way that the industry can do best is to work together with the governments in their countries and globally uh, through the World Economic Forum and other groups to try to really um, work together to understand where there might be less risk in certain sectors which could begin to um, open up now, now that the clampdown has occurred, at least after the next two or three weeks when governments will try to reassess their, their policies because the governments that have um, asked people to stay at home and self-isolate will be reevaluating on a regular basis, but many of them have set a period of early April to make another assessment. So if industry can feed into those assessments, it's very important. And as you said, the, the problem is not just for um, people whose salaries are shut down, but it's for people who have um, barely enough to live from month to month, and that is people in every country in the world. Yeah. And they're having been cut off from their income, maybe they're daily workers, maybe they're not, um, is going to cause a great inequality and a great problem for many countries as well. Let's move on to the, the critical question, critical issue of the, the vaccine. Um, you know, we've read uh, in Massachusetts, for example, U.S. company Moderna Therapeutics um, is working on an experimental vaccine, could be available to a select few as soon as this fall, but they say a uh, uh, it wouldn't be commercially available for at least a year. What's the situation on and likely timeline on any vaccine? And can the increasing um, economic uh, urgency of this matter uh, hasten the process? Where are the bottlenecks? Um, and, and, and how effective indeed uh, could a vaccine be? They're shortcutting the animal trials in many instances and going directly into human trials. So this is a, a new way that companies are working. And um, even if they do have some vaccine candidates, which are shown to be effective in humans, they still then have to go into through the ramp up of identifying a production partner and production. If there is a vaccine that's effective, shown to be effective and it's available, it would be available likely by early next year. Having said that, nobody is really clear about how long immunity can last after a person has infection, natural infection, or even a vaccine. And so the question is, if that vaccine is effective, would it be effective in one dose? Would it need more than one dose? Would it need continued booster doses? Those questions all have to be answered in the future. Okay. There, Martin, there is a lot of work going on on drug development, again, but that work has to be done um, it's being done right now by looking at drugs that are against viruses we know and seeing if they have any action against this virus, which we didn't know previously. And there are some multi-center studies going on in places where there are many, uh, many cases looking at drugs such as chloroquine or chloroquine plus azithromycin or other antiviral drugs um, that are being studied um, in um, very rigorous case control studies looking at what happens in persons who get them and looking what happens in persons who don't get them. So these are studies which are going on, but if there is an antiviral preparation that's useful, it will have to be used early in infection because using it after someone is already moribund or on a ventilator will not have any impact. It has to be used very early in the infection as do the antiviral drugs for influenza. There are also studies going on on antibody monoclonal antibodies, which resemble the antibodies or which are a part of the antibodies that appear to be protecting in humans. And those studies are going on in small biotechs. And certain uh, research institutions are collecting whole blood or serum plasma from persons who have been infected and recovered, taking from that plasma the antibody um, and studying that antibody, but also attempting to use it to either prevent infection or serious illness in persons who have been in contact or are identified early on as being infected. So there's a remarkable amount of information going on, both for drugs and for vaccines, but nothing yet has shown any of, the, uh, um, of those to be effective.
one of the things I suppose for any business sector, but maybe more the travel sector than almost any other, is that once this is dealt with in whichever way, vaccine or it, it, it recedes dramatically, um, is it going to happen again? How can we minimize the risk of, of further virus outbreaks in the future and learn from this global experience? When this is over, there will be a changed world and people will have developed ways of working that they had never used before. And some of those ways of working will increase in importance. Uh, for example, what we're doing now, a, a Zoom conference, um, I'm doing Zoom conferences with many people every day. Uh, these normally would have been face-to-face -face meetings. We're seeing now that you can cut down the number of face-to-face -face meetings and have as effective outcomes as you could and less disruptive to daily, um, to daily agendas. So it may be that in the future there is less travel for face-to-face -face meetings, for example, and more getting together virtually, which will have an impact on the travel industry, especially on airlines, especially on those airlines that have survived this, this severe blow because some airlines will not make it as, as we understand, others will. The same with the cruise ship industry. Um, there will need to be some confidence building measures that can ensure passengers or people who are taking holidays on ships that they won't end up on an, in a situation as such as has happened in several of the cruise ships in the past. And this will be based on innovation. Um, and you know, we're very innovative. Humans are very innovative. And there will be innovations that come along that will work in this changed world to instill confidence in passengers. And so these will all be important things for the industry to be thinking about now as they move ahead, understanding that it will be a changed world and that what we had counted on for incomes in the past may not be so sure in the future. I hate to paint a gloomy picture, but that's the reality as I see it. All right, indeed. I'm going to pass over to Dermot. I think you've got a couple of uh, questions. Dermot, over to you. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Dermot Davis here, and good morning again, Dr. Heyman. Um, you mentioned and discussed both the uh, areas of vaccine and drug testing, and we had a question in, um, noting that medical authorities in China have said that the Avigan, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, drug used in Japan to treat new strains of influenza was or appeared to be effective in coronavirus patients um, in China. Do you think this could be an efficient solution, or are there others that are uh, being tested that, that might be as efficient or, or more so? Yeah, there are a whole series of, of drugs. There are some that are used for HIV infection virus, some that are used for other uh, viruses such as the Lassa fever virus and even the Ebola virus that are being studied uh, first through um, laboratory testing and then in humans. And China has gone into human um, research and human trials much uh, more rapidly than many other countries which are influenced by different types of regulatory agencies. Um, the information, as I understand it from China, is now being looked at by the World Health Organization and others um, in research groups. In fact, tomorrow there's a research group meeting virtually at WHO where they'll be discussing some of this. Um, they're looking at what has shown to be possibly uh, promising but nothing is really, can really be shown to be effective unless there have been rigorous case control studies, comparative studies of people who receive the drug and people at the same stage in infection who don't receive the drug to see what the impact of that is, or a comparative trial of one drug that's thought to be effective against another drug that's thought to be effective. And these trials have been done in China, but they don't have the numbers of people enrolled in those trials to really give the statistical validity that people would like to see before they make any recommendations on any drugs. But I think within the next two weeks, there will be some initial results that will be released that will give an idea of what might be useful. Um, and so, you know, those studies are going on. Um, WHO is coordinating some of them. Um, individual research groups are doing others. And there should be results coming out very soon. But the problem is, these drugs have to be used early in infection. And what many countries are seeing is not those people early in infection, but those who are overwhelming the health system because they're already in acute respiratory distress. And those people who are requiring um, ventilation will not 
probably have a chance of survival with any antiviral and possibly even those who are less seriously ill. So yes, there are promising drugs, but none has been successfully done, used in a study that has the, the statistical power to say that they are effective in treating this infection. And just finally, from, from my side, do you think that th what we're seeing now and these outbreaks will be something that we might see as, as more common and, and, and part of our, our world and shall we should prepare ourselves or almost price in as businesses um, a world in which, in which this is a risk, a risk factor where there are global shutdowns and that community and societies need to be prepared for those to be uh, a more common part of, of the, the future for us? Yeah, I would hope that, that industry will get together and take the warning. You know, not many groups did take the warning after the SARS outbreak. And as a result, um, nobody is really prepared for this outbreak, even though Asia is prepared. The countries that had SARS were prepared. They developed the capacity, uh, the extra beds and the ventilator surpluses that they felt they needed. Many other countries did not heed the warning and industry did not heed the warning either. In fact, they stopped investment in goods that could have been useful should SARS have reoccurred and they went on to invest in other things. So now we're seeing a country which is changed we have new opportunities, and hopefully after this is finally over, those opportunities and innovation will be used to develop new ways of facing a world where we're at risk of infection spreading very rapidly internationally. It's important to remember that every infection in humans, whether it's tuberculosis, whether it's AIDS, whether it's seasonal influenza, all originated in the animal kingdom, but they originated in the past in many instances when they were able to circulate a while in a national or local population and then begin their slow spread internationally, AIDS being a good example. It started emerged in human populations at the beginning of the 20th century, yet it didn't spread internationally till it got into a capital city where there were risk behaviors that amplified transmission, and then it hopped on airplanes and spread around the world silently. So, you know, these things have occurred in the past, they'll continue to occur in the future we maybe now need to think of new ways of dealing with them, including more involvement from the private sector in, in their contingency planning. Dr. Heyman, thank you so much for a very honest, unemotional, uh, helpful, albeit deeply sobering perspective uh, for which we're all very grateful. We're also immensely grateful to you and all your colleagues. Um, I think right across the health and medical sector from um, you and your colleagues at the level you're operating at globally, um, strategically, um, and applying the lessons of the past to helping hopefully to guide the world out of this, but right down to the front line, uh, the, the nurses and the doctors and others all around the world who, um, who are helping the world somehow uh, cope with this. Um, with this terrible illness. I know you're, you are a family man. Your own family uh, is involved, as you were telling me earlier, um, directly um, in hospitals. We wish them well, of course. Our hearts are with them and our thoughts as they are with you. And thank you for all you are doing uh, on, on behalf of us and on our behalf of society. And once again, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks very much, uh, Martin. And we all have a role to play, and I think we're all doing that. All right. Dr. David Heyman, thank you very much, and thank you very much, listeners.